Hello everyone. Well, we just had a fantastic three days here at the Buck Institute with, with Linda Partridge and uh, she gave a wonderful seminar and we got a chance to go out on the, the, the bay and sail over to San Francisco. But also we got had this uh, wonderful uh, hour spent uh, talking about her work and her, her science career. In between episodes, I get a chance to check in with Stella again, who I believe is still in Africa, maybe still in Nairobi. Stella is, of course, our amazing editor. Uh, she has a PhD in pharmacogenomics from UCSF and uh, is our, our nomad editor. Last we heard from her from Nairobi and she's been doing some stand up. And uh, where are you this week, Stella? Hi, Gordon. Yes, I'm still in Nairobi and I've been doing a bit of work, but I'm super excited because I'm heading to the coast this weekend. So I might do a safari of the sea, maybe see some lions, sea lions, get it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here all week. So I have this question from this episode where I think I've talked, we've talked about this before, but it's this idea of a trade-off. You know, I want to discuss what this trade-off actually means. Are they saying there's a cost of reproductivity during youth? Is there increased aging? What does this mean for us? I think this is super important, Stella. I, you know, the idea comes from evolutionary biology, and this is obviously Linda's background. And, you know, we touched on this with Steve Ostad as well. Um, the idea that, that aging um, is tied to the rest of biology, you know, it's tied to development and fertility. And it's actually those processes that are under the, the force of natural selection that, that, that really play out in an aging context in, in the absence of selection during their entire history. So, you know, for all the time that animals have been on this planet, there's not been a lot of aging happening. And it's only now that we see the effects of these processes on aging itself. So the idea is that there's trade-offs. And so when you extend lifespan or you improve some aspect of aging, then maybe there's a cost. And maybe you're interfering with processes that are, are there for some other purpose, such as reproduction and development. And so when we go in and we make a genetic change or we make a nutritional change, it's possible that the benefits can come with costs. Now, maybe not. And, and I think we've got good evidence that you can separate these, which is really exciting, right? That, that you know, that you can get around the biology and come in with an intervention that doesn't come with a, an obvious cost. But it's a bit like every drug that we, we've ever known about, that there's always side effects and there's always dangers and you have to understand what a drug is doing and you have to understand that the concentrations and the dose and the timings and everything has to be right. And I think it's the same with aging interventions. They are going to come with costs for the most part, but we need to understand those costs. And that requires that requires research in, in evolutionary biology. That's interesting. So. I also want to talk about this idea of dietary restriction. So, you know, we hear a lot about intermittent fasting and how it has benefits. But I also, in the conversation, we talk about starvation and, you know, autophagy happening and benefiting survival and fitness. How does this play in with aging? This must be one of the most exciting frontiers in aging research right now. Yeah, I mean, we've known about caloric restriction since the 50s, where people were taking the, 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 the number of calories in the diet back from rodents, reducing it by 40%, and seeing these remarkable increases in lifespan. And actually health as well, uh, you know, the pathology of aging in these animals was greatly improved. So we've known about it for all this time, um, but, but really we're just coming to a deep understanding of it now. And we also realize that, that calories is only part of the story and that different nutrients in the diet are having different effects on aging. Um, many, many people are working on this right now. It's very exciting, the idea of intermittent fasting, the idea of restricted feeding times, uh, all very powerful. And I think we have to think about, you know, how did we evolve? I just want to touch on this, this trade-off thing again. How did we evolve? We didn't evolve with the number of calories that we have at our disposal today. And some of the characteristics of aging may reflect that. And maybe what we're really doing with these interventions is going back to a more natural uh, relationship between our diet and our bodies and our health. And also you mentioned autophagy, which is this process which uh, highly conserved again between different species which is really a way of cells to get rid of the, the damaged proteins and, and organelles and so on. 
Uh, self-eating is, is the definition. And autophagy is super important for clearing up damage. So it's not surprising that it's really important for extended lifespan and all sorts of different interventions. Um, but like most things in aging, it's a double-edged sword. And we've got to understand when autophagy could be detrimental as well. You can imagine a runaway situation where you're, you're getting rid of organelles and proteins and, and DNA and lipids and things in the cells that are actually beneficial. So again, we have to understand when it's, it's good to ramp up autophagy and when we should take a step back from it. That sounds like a really good episode for the future. Yeah, I'd love to have an episode on that. There's so many uh, talented young researchers are, are digging into autophagy right now in aging. Mm -hmm. So speaking of new episodes, who are we talking to next? Well, next up is a good friend near Barzilai. And, and this is going to be really exciting because near is at the, the leading edge of applying aging interventions to humans. And we're going to be talking about human clinical trials and, and how do we actually translate these findings in the biology of aging into something that's meaningful to, to all our listeners. Cool. Can't wait. <laughs>